Carl. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this is the last session on for the spectral geometry session. Um, what, uh, what I was going to say is please mute yourself unless you're Steve. And I'm now going to introduce him. Yeah, Steve Seldich is our first speaker. He's going to be talking about how analytic centrally symmetric plane domains are spectrally determined in that class. Okay, nice to see all of you again. And so uh, my talk is a joint work with Hamid Hazari. Um, it's part of a series of papers that we're writing on the inverse spectral problem. And this one is about analytic centrally symmetric domains. So as everybody knows, uh, the inverse spectral problem has to do with, uh, oh, I think I'm gonna use lambda squared for the rest of this talk, but so it has to do with the eigenvalue problem, uh, let's say Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions and some kind of a compact, everything in this talk will be not necessarily, but uh, compact smooth plane domains. All right, so it's about centrally symmetric domains. And so central symmetry is the map of the plane to the plane that takes uh, X, x and r2 to minus x. And so a centrally symmetric domain is a domain which is invariant under this isometric involution. So uh, here is an example of a centrally symmetric domain. And in both cases, we're drawing a, 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 an orbit of the billiards, which is called a bouncing ball orbit because it hits the boundary uh, orthogonally at both endpoints. So I want, we want to prove an inverse spectral theorem for such domains. And it's quite, it's uh, similar in nature to a, an old theorem that if you have an up-down symmetric domain, then a uh, real analytic with a bouncing ball orbit, then uh, it's determined by its eigenvalues among other domains in the same class. So these are called conditional and respectful theorems because we're restricting the class of domains that we're solving it for. So here are some more pictures of centrally symmetric domains. And uh, so in particular, if you try to draw an orb, a bouncing ball orbit uh, through the center, it may or may not stay inside of the domain. Here's an example where, where it does, but this example, it goes outside the domain. That's very non-convex. And our, our results uh, do uh, include non-convex domains. But on the other hand, they always have a bouncing ball orbit. So here, this little red gamma is <coughs> a, um, a convex, um, a not, uh, sorry, a bouncing ball orbit in a non-convex domain. When you have a star-shaped centrally symmetric domain, it has two orbits. So the idea of focusing on uh, bouncing ball orbits to solve the inverse spectral problem has a long history going back to the 70s uh, when uh, Vladimir Lazutkin, uh, Babich, and others studied uh, eigenvalues associated to bouncing ball orbits and Colin de Verrier um, proved a very nice theorem about uh, recovering Birkhoff normal forms using length spectrum invariance and bouncing ball orbits. Uh, okay, so here's the class of domains that we're going to be discussing. D sub L, these are simply connected, centrally symmetric, uh, real analytic plane domains. And then they satisfy a finite number of additional conditions. It, we've, it, they always have a bouncing ball orbit where we're just gonna fix the length to be L. So this is not really, this is a notational uh, restriction, not really a restriction on the domains. And uh, there's a restriction on the um, eigenvalues of the Poincaré map for the bouncing ball orbit. There's a very small restriction that this cosine alpha over two does not belong in a set of three possible elements here. That's a kind of non-degeneracy condition. There's a, a condition which uh, is really quite unfortunate, but you know, it's, it's there, which is that uh, the third derivative, so the bouncing ball orbit is gonna be viewed as vertical. So it's, it lies over X equal to zero. And we have to assume that the third derivative 
we locally represent the boundary as the graph of a function and the third derivative does not vanish there. So then there's a multiplicity once in the length spectrum. I'll point out later on, actually half of our paper is to show that these are generic conditions for real analytic domains. It's rather strange, but there's very little that has been studied about generic properties of analytic anything. Maybe only three papers I've found in the literature. That, there are many, many papers that discuss, discuss generic properties in the C infinity category, if you like. Almost none that discuss them for the real analytic. The real analytic topology is rather complicated. So anyway, that's uh, probably half our paper is just to prove that these conditions are actually open dense for convex domains and generic for non-convex domains. And then here's the theorem. We can take either Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions. The boundary conditions play very little role. And then you look at the map from domains into the spectrum of the domain, which we list in an increasing order in the usual way. And so the theorem is that uh, in this class, in this class DL of domains, uh, they're essentially symmetric domains with bouncing ball orbit of length L, uh, 2L. Uh, this map from uh, domains uh, into the spectrum is 1-1. One, one. So, um, yeah, so the real analytic, that's very crucial. So the classes and also the class here is a generic among real analytic centrally symmetric domains with a bouncing ball orbit of length L. We can fix that because it's a spectral invariant. So I don't usually mention it. So that's our result. So just to put this into context, because I'm not going to review the history of it, there are really only three classes of domains for which positive results of this kind are known. On the one hand, there are up-down analytic, up-down symmetric analytic domains. And this paper is kind of in the same spirit, very much in the same spirit, uses the same techniques. And then uh, aside from that, it's just the ellipses of small eccentricity are known to be uh, spectrally determined among all possible smooth domains. So that's the only unconditional inverse spectral result about the here the shape of the jump problem, which was proved by Hazari and myself in 2019. So although this is really very similar to the one about up-down domains, we uh, decided to write it up in detail for two reasons. One is it's the only class that's known besides those other two. And secondly, there was a rather nice article by Bialy and Mironov about uh, ellipses and centrally symmetric domains, which used a rather novel argument involving four link bouncing, four link trajectory, billiard trajectories, rather than these two link bouncing ball orbits. And that was the original idea was to try to implement their four link orbit, but the wave invariants at four link orbits are too complicated, even if you have essential symmetry. And then we realized there was a simpler way of getting a better result. So how do we do it? Well, um, basically there are only two approaches to the inverse spectral problem for the Ketz problem. Can you say shape it? Here the shape of a drum. One is to study the trace of the wave group, which everybody in this audience is probably thoroughly familiar with. And you look at, you try to calculate the coefficients in the trace of the wave group, and then you try to recover the domain from the coefficients. And that, uh, that's why we just have to assume the domain is analytic, as we'll see. The only really other approach is to um, calculate uh, one or two or three uh, spectral invariants pretty much by this procedure, and then to try to study extremal domains for those invariants. And the most successful is due to a mathematician named Watanabe. Uh, the, other, the other cases, Melrose and Marvisi tried using that approach for ellipses. They found some very nice invariants. They studied the extremals for the invariants, but they could never prove that they were ellipses. The same with Watanabe. The, 
problem with that approach is that you never quite know what are your extremals. So it just becomes there exists some extremal domains which are determined by their eigenvalues. Nevertheless, that extremal stuff has not been exploited very much. So people in the audience might want to think about those problems. There are lots and lots of interesting spectral invariants. You can try to find extremals for them. So what are wave trace invariants? This is too complicated to explain in a 20 minute talk. So if you know it, I'm sure everybody here pretty much already has seen these things. In other words, you take the trace of the wave group, that's a, a tempered distribution in T. You know, it has uh, singularities at the lengths of closed orbits. And then you take a Fourier transform of the wave, of the wave trace, uh, put it in uh, E to the IKT and take an asymptotic expansion and powers of K. And you get a sum, you get sums over different uh, periodic orbits. And then for each periodic orbit, you get an infinite sequence of spectral invariants. So here we're just going to pick uh, this, this cutoff function to be supported uh, in a small interval around the length of the bouncing ball orbit. And we're only going to pick up the wave trace invariants for a bouncing ball orbit. And so the, the leading coefficient was calculated by Balian and Bloch in a very beautiful paper of 1971. Uh, I might mention, by the way, uh, that it was the paper that Colin de Verrier first read before he wrote his thesis. Uh, Marcel Berger noticed that paper. <laughs> Aside from myself and a couple other people, it almost hasn't been read since, but it's a very nice paper. So anyway, the leading coefficient involves various invariants, the length of the orbit, so in a sense, we can hear the length of an orbit. We can determine from the eigenvalues, the Maslow index. There is a uh, sign depending on the boundary conditions. Reflections, uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions, you pick up a minus sign for each reflection. For Neumann, you don't. Then down here, you get the square root of the determinant of one minus the Poincaré map. This is making the assumption that the bouncing ball orbit is not degenerate. And um, OK, so. You try to calculate these. And I just br very briefly say that, well, I'm gonna talk about this at the end of the talk. The linear Poincaré map is a linear approximation to the billiard map around the bouncing ball orbit. And we're assuming that this determinant is non-zero and the orbit could be either elliptic, which means its eigenvalues are roots of, are, are of modulus one, or it could be hyperbolic and you get two uh, inverse real eigenvalues. So there are different things. And I wanted to put down this slide, which may be too complicated for a 20 minute talk, but the, the question is, so let me, uh, let me just, do I have a picture here? No picture? Where did my picture go? Wait, yeah. Uh, I write the domain locally as the graph of y equals f plus of x at the top, y is f minus x at the bottom. Here's the bouncing ball orbit in between. And the idea is to relate the uh, wave trace invariance to the Taylor coefficients of this F plus and F minus at the endpoints. Actually, you're really uh, only able to determine the top one. So you need some relation between the top and the bottom to be able to determine the domain. So um, uh, here's a formula that's, uh, this led to a rather surprising thing which uh, perhaps is the most interesting novelty of the paper, which is, uh, well, you calculate what the determinant of the Poincaré map is for the orbit or for any iterate of the orbit. So you get an explicit formula, which you can find in any text on billiards. On the other hand, you can write down the following expression involving the second derivative of the defining function at the endpoints. And you find out you get a quadratic formula for f double prime at zero. So uh, you don't get a unique answer to this because you, you, when you take roots, you know there are two different, uh, e both in the elliptic and hyperbolic case, there actually are two possible roots for this. So, so uh, as we'll see, this leads to an ambiguity in the problem. It's the only ambiguity once you know the second derivative of F plus at zero over the bouncing ball orbit, then you can recover the whole rest of the domain by a certain algorithm. And the algorithm 
is essentially the one from an old paper of mine where you did sort of uh, recursively solve for the Taylor coefficients in terms of, of uh, the uh, wave trace invariance, but you have to pick exactly the right one. They get hysterically complicated as uh, you go further out into the wave trace expansion. So, all right, so um, yeah, so I, I think I just mentioned this. There's a very complicated algebraic procedure, but it was worked out in, in detail and it works for the, the main point is it works for essentially symmetric domains as well as up down symmetric domains. There are di distinctions in the algebra, but it works in both cases. So you try to determine the Kähler coefficients. This was, I think I really would say originally Colin de Verdier's idea back in the seventies when he was trying to understand the Taylor coefficients of a domain from length spectrum invariance rather than from wave trace invariance dynamical invariance. And uh, he just assumed that the second derivatives of F were fixed at the endpoints of a bouncing ball orbit. But it turns out you can actually determine the, you can resolve the ambiguity using Mavlov indices in the quantum case. And so that naturally uh, just barely like, you know, uh, scrape by, you can use uh, Maslow indices to distinguish between the two roots here and get the algorithm started. But these are quantum mechanical things that are not really classical mechanical things. They're not length spectrum invariants. So um, let's see, I think, uh, so what, what happens is that uh, although uh, using the entire quantum Birkhoff normal form of the wave trace invariance, you can completely determine the Taylor expansion of F and recover the domain. There, there's a, this very interesting thing that you have two possible values for F double prime at zero. As I said, the Maslow index can distinguish between them, but classical Birkhoff normal form invariance cannot. That is the only classical invariance that involve the second derivative of the Planckere eigenvalues. And it turns out that the second derivative is not uniquely determined. And that led us to ask the question, um, how about constructing two different domains with the property that the billiard map for the bouncing ball orbit, the Birkhoff normal form is identical for these two domains. Colin de Verdier's procedure and the one in our papers is entirely based on trying to recover the domain from Birkhoff normal form invariants, which are very closely related to wave trace invariants. And what we discovered is you cannot do that. You cannot recover the domain uniquely from just classical Birkhoff normal form invariants. There are two distinct domains, one having F double prime given by this, the other domain F G double prime is given by that one. And uh, they have different second derivative and as soon as they have a different second derivative, every single Birkhoff normal form coefficient, uh, yeah, I mean, sorry, they uh, have exactly the same Birkhoff normal form coefficients, which are these cosine alpha over twos. These are the Planck ray eigenvalues. That's part of, that's the linear part of the Birkhoff normal form. So they have the same classical Birkhoff normal forms, but they are not the same domain. So you, uh, uh, if you start recovering Taylor coefficients, but starting at these different values of the second derivative, you end up with different Taylor coefficients, Taylor series. Steve, and so a, do you have like a plus sign or something or? Oh, one of these should be a plus. Whoops, I think I wrote this down wrong. What, this is a minus one. This should have been a plus in, inside of okay, this here. Thank you. In between the minus one and the cosine, there should have been a plus right here. Thanks. So the moral of the story is, I mean, it's sort of a byproduct of this, which is that they have the, uh, they, they, they are distinguished. They're two, these are non-isometric domains. If, they, if, if they're essentially symmetric, but they have different uh, second derivative at zero, they're not isometric domains. In fact, all their tail coefficients are different, but um, they, all their Birkhoff normal form coefficients are different because the Birkhoff normal form only involves the alpha here, that's the Planck Ryan value. The F double prime here is not a Birkhoff, classical Birkhoff normal form invariant. So it, it's sort of like, is a negative result on the extent to which you can recover domains by knowing the classical Birkhoff normal form at a bouncing ball orbit. Uh, we're in progress proving that it's, it's impossible. <laughs>
Okay, so let me stop here. Thank you, Steve. The least you could do is do a tango. <laughs> Are there any questions for Steve? Steve, if, if you have Z3 symmetries. Uh, yeah, I did that a, a long time ago. Dihedral symmetries. If you have a, a real analytic domain with a dihedral symmetry group, I can't quite remember if I needed an even order or an odd order or whatever, but yeah, you can, you can you, dihedral symmetry works more or less the same way as up-down symmetry or central symmetry. Thanks. Anyone else? And uh, uh, so for, for smooth, uh, this difficult, yeah, or? The smooth is like insanely complicated um, to the extent that almost nobody even tries doing it because of the following thing. Obviously you cannot determine the domain from just one, just the Birkhoff normal form invariance or wave invariance in one geodesic. So you have to put together more than one. Well, how do you do that? Um, well, for general domains, there's no known method of combining information, even at two bouncing ball orbits. So uh, what do people do? Either they assume that the domain is extraordinarily special like an ellipse, and then it has very unusual length spectrum properties and other properties. And that's what Hazari and I exploited for the inverse result. The other thing that you can do is study isospectral deformations because then automatically you have sort of put together information from all the different orbits. I see. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any more questions? I, I do have one question, Steve, that yeah. I wasn't understanding. Um, you, you mentioned um, some people working and using a, a four-link orbit to... This is Bialy and Mironov. There are quite a number of groups of people who want to prove Birkhoff's conjecture that ellipses are the unique billiard domains whose billiards are integrable. So there's been very uh, profound series of papers by Koloshin with Casey Moy and Sorrentino and Avila and... Um, so, prove, so they proved a local version that the first Avila, Desimoy, and Colossian proved that if you have a, a domain which is uh, an ellipse of very small eccentricity, so you have nearly circular domains, then um, if they're rationally integrable, which means that their periodic orbits come in one parameter of families for all bounce numbers greater than or equal to three, then um, you can determine them. And then uh, Kaloshin and Sorrentino later, a couple years later, proved that you can do that same argument locally around any ellipse. If you have to be very, very close to an ellipse, the domain has to be very close to an ellipse. And uh, yeah, if it has, if it's what's called rationally integrable, then, uh, then uh, it's, it's, you can determine the ellipse from any other possible domain nearby it. And in particular, it is a length spectrally rigid. I see. A nice, a nice observation of Hamid Azari is that it's length spectrally rigid. Um, yeah, so. Uh, okay, so then my question is, can you study wave trace invariance when you have a four link orbit and use the central Yeah, so that's, no, there's no problem, yeah. In fact, I did do that. There's no problem, as it were, calculating the wave trace invariance for four link orbits. Now, the thing is that, remember, so here, here's like, uh, like historically people assume you have two symmetries, up, down, and right, left. That's what uh, Colin Verdier first assumed and I first assumed later on in the spectral problem. So then you only have to get even Taylor coefficients of the F plus function, which is the same as the F minus function and all the odd coefficients is zero. And you kind of a very- Or something like that to express the sum. So, sorry? So you, what do you do? You use the vertices of the orbit? And yes. Like so the problem, yeah, the problem is, so then we got, uh, you know, just up-down symmetry, which means you can actually get even and odd Taylor coefficients from the wave trace invariance. Then the problem is, so that's the limit. 
then the problem is you're going to have a four link orbit, even if it's centrally symmetric, you're going to have to get even an odd Taylor coefficient at two distinct vertices. So at the present time, it just doesn't look hot feasible to be able to determine the Taylor coefficients from all those Taylor coefficients. That's like even and odd in, at one point and even okay. and odd at another. And you know, you get these just insanely complicated. It's not actually, it's not that they're so complicated if you know how to run the argument. It's just that you get potential cancellations among these different terms. Yeah. Okay. There's no way to decouple them. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think I interrupted someone who was about to ask a question when I asked mine. Is, uh, is that still the case? No, it's not the case. It was a stupid question. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, well, let's thank Steve again then. And let's take a couple of minutes and uh, 